Kenyans speaking with one voice. And it's the first time we've ever seen it in our history. And there are mostly young people who have gone out on the streets saying, we are jobless, we are poor, and we want a better life for ourselves. Welcome to Global Dispatches, a podcast for the foreign policy and global development communities and anyone who wants a deeper understanding of what is driving events in the world today. I'm your host, Mark Leon Goldberg. I am a veteran international affairs journalist and the editor of UN Dispatch. Enjoy the show. On Tuesday, June 25th, Kenyan protesters stormed parliament in Nairobi in scenes reminiscent of the January 6 siege of the U.S. Capitol. However, unlike January 6, police responded violently, and at least six people were killed. The protests had been ongoing for days as the Kenyan parliament moved on a finance bill that would increase taxes for ordinary Kenyans in unusual ways. Like many countries in Africa, the government of Kenya faces an extreme level of debt and was looking for new sources of revenue to service its debt payments while also keeping government functioning. Following the protests, President William Ruto said he would no longer pursue this taxation bill. While protests in Kenya are hardly unusual, what makes this protest movement so unique, according to my guest today, Brian Obara, is that it was not organized along ethnic, tribal, or even class divides. Rather, it was youth-led and broad-based, and that could signal a profound change in Kenyan politics. Brian Obara is a Kenyan lawyer and media professional and columnist for The Star, a daily newspaper in Nairobi. We kick off discussing what was in this ill-fated finance bill that so agitated Kenyans. We then discuss what transpired in the protests and what this episode suggests for the future of politics in Kenya. Kenya is a major regional economic hub, a multi-party democracy, and also a key player in both regional and international politics. So events like this really do have broad global implications. Just a couple quick announcements before we start. First, a huge thank you to everyone who is supporting Global Dispatch's newest project, our podcast about the United Nations to save us from hell. We've published our first two episodes. You can follow the links in the show notes of this episode to access to save us from hell. You can also search for it wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much for your support as we launch this new project off the ground. I'm really excited about it. Now, here is my conversation with Brian Obara, a media professional in Kenya and columnist for The Star. Brian, to kick off, can I just have you explain what was in this proposed bill that got people so agitated and angry? What was in this finance bill 2024 was a raft of measures that were basically an amendment to the current Finance Act 2023. And some of the provisions that got a lot of Kenyans very angry are provisions that required taxing bread which is the kind of stuff that, you know, has set off revolutions in other parts of the world, for example, here in neighboring Sudan, and also attacks on financial transactions, attacks on babies' diapers, attacks on sanitary pads, and also attacks on uh, motor vehicles, which apply to a lot of Kenya's middle class. So it's a kind of bill that had provisions that had so many sections of the Kenyan society very angry at members of parliament for even entertaining this proposal from our treasury. I mean, these taxes, as you describe them, just sound so like regressive. They hit the people who can't afford them the hardest. Absolutely. And, you know, the question was, because a lot of people were saying, how 
could any reasonable you know government expect that its citizens would stomach this and they come on top of the finance act 2023 which itself introduced other provisions and taxes that Kenyans were still not very happy with including a housing tax that required a lot of the Kenyans who are employees to pay a tax so that the government could build what they were saying is affordable housing so the issue was we're already in pain and you're trying to you know make us even more poor using these tax measures that you're introducing but then you would understand that where we are right now is a situation in which Kenya has a huge debt burden the country owes about 45 billion with a b in debt just to external borrowers and a lot of that is owed to the chinese as well as other multilateral lenders so the country is really at a tough spot and we appreciate that the government is having to you know do a lot to make sure that the country can still meet its obligations but there comes a point where you can't squeeze water out of a stone and people have to leave so there was that push and pull and the government didn't seem to be listening and that's why we're here now yeah i mean the extraordinary debt that kenya finds itself in you said 45 billion dollars i've seen that like most government revenue at this point comes and is devoted to servicing that debt as opposed to paying for government services which is just kind of wild to even think about like how do ordinary Kenyans like is there any way in which like you in your life as a media professional that this massive external debt that Kenya owes just impacts you on any sort of meaningful way in a daily basis Absolutely I would wager that there are very few Kenyans if any at all that haven't been impacted by the cost of living crisis that the country is experiencing currently For example in the last year 55% of the revenue that was collected in the country went off to paying debt I saw a, a ridiculous statistic just saying something like over 90% of the money that was collected in January alone January went to pay debt. So the economy is on its deathbed. People are feeling it. In my life I was working in a media house last year but I had to leave because our salaries were getting late. I know many friends who have lost their jobs. I know people right now who are living from check to check and there were people who were prosperous just a year or so ago. So it sucked the money out of the economy the situation that we are in a lot of people are feeling it that's why the anger is at a boiling point and i don't think the government is the situation correctly because a lot of dynamics that we're seeing that are fed the situation is not just that they can see that the country has to pay this debt but it's that the politicians are kind of rubbing the situation in our face in the sense that we can also see that the corruption that has been you know the bane of our existence as a country is still going on so you see the politicians still rolling in the biggest and most expensive fuel guzzlers that they can buy you are seeing them buying choppers and moving around in choppers you are seeing the expensive watches that some of them are wearing you know mark now we are in a world in which you can literally go on social media and you can find a photo of a politician that was taken that day and next to it is somebody who has costed the value of that watch and mm-hmm. this includes even the president of the republic himself who the other day there was a photo of him in the paper and Paul was saying that watch that he was wearing I forget the brand name but it's an, an Italian watchmaker was 6 million shillings you can imagine so that anger that you just described reached a really dramatic moment on Tuesday in which you saw these really just wild images frankly not terribly unfamiliar to us in the United States based on what happened on January 6 of an angry mob storming parliament can you just describe like what happened who was part of that mob and that broader social movement and for those who didn't follow the events of that day and what happened subsequently very closely just explain what transpired so tuesday was i believe the third day of protest because you have had them from tuesday thursday you know in the last couple of weeks so what happened on tuesday is the day before there was a lot of anger because people were saying parliament is not listening and what the MPs had done the day before is that they had done the first reading and the issue was that Kenyans felt that even though they had removed some of the provisions that had made Kenyans angry they were not still you know rejecting the bill in its entirety which is what a lot of people especially online were saying so you had a lot of angry people on social media especially TikTok and Twitter and the hashtag that they were using is occupy parliament and the police responded by saying you know parliament has never been occupied in our history it's not going to happen 
you guys are not going to make it there. So it seemed as if there was a standoff that was going to happen on Tuesday. And I, myself, waking up that day, really thought, you know, I was going to see a lot of protests in the city. But I knew there was no way that people would actually make it into parliament itself. I've been to that building a few times. I've seen the security there. I knew it was going to be stepped up. I never expected that the protesters would actually make it into parliament itself. But it actually happened. People did break into parliament and they did get into the Senate premises and they did cause a lot of destruction all around the building. It's still footage that, you know, is still being shared all over our social media that you still can't believe. I think you feel like it's some sort of like deep fake, even though you, you've seen enough videos. And I think it stunned the president and it stunned the police force. It stunned a lot of Kenyans. And the reaction in the evening was a very unhappy president saying the institutions of our country have been defiled and that he was going to react accordingly. He said he was going to use his powers to bring the army out of the barracks and uh, into the streets to restore order. And that's what has happened. Even today, you know, the army is out in the streets. The Law Society of Kenya has taken that army deployment to court. We're expecting a tussle. Even if any of the parties win at the high court, we're expecting it to go even to the highest court in the country, which is the Supreme Court. So it's still a, a developing story, but what we're witnessing are absolute scenes that we've never witnessed before. And it's all down to a tone-deaf executive and a citizenry that has just had enough. What has been the police response? You mentioned the army was out on the streets, but I've seen reports as well of somewhat unrestrained violence being meted out against the protesters by police. What can you say about the police response and the security forces response? So it's something I've written about myself because what we have in our constitution, which was promulgated in 2010, is the right to protest especially to have a peaceful protest anywhere in the country as long as you notify the police. They don't have, the police, unlike in our previous constitution, don't have to give permission for anybody to protest. You just have to notify them. So you can send a letter to the police and say, you know, we'll be protesting in this area from this time to this time. We are asking for your awareness and for you to provide security. And that's what the protesters have been doing. But the police reaction has been, unfortunately, very forceful. And it's especially grating for some of us because, you know, a lot of the people who are out on the streets are very young people. I was out on the streets as a reporter on Tuesday. One of I saw are people who are, I would say, the age group with a few exceptions, of course, like myself, because I'm in my 30s. Most of them were people who are between the ages of 18 and 25. Very young people out on the streets. But the police have been very forceful in their reactions to the point of shooting two protesters on the first day itself and many more in the days that have followed. And yesterday, the president said that six protesters had been killed. But actually, the numbers that we're hearing from civil society and from other observers is that at least 23 people died in Tuesday's now protests. Hmm. So we're seeing a police force that is much more aggressive than it should be. And it's completely unwarranted because the protests have been very peaceful. So the situation actually only turns more violent when the police get involved because they are the ones who introduce that violent element. I should say, like, some of the, the images I've seen of the storming of parliament, that was not peaceful. Oh, okay. I would accept that point. I think it's very true that some of the protesters did provoke the police into at least trying to react but there are some Kenyan elements which there is a tendency among some Kenyan politicians whenever they are unhappy with the situation, at least according to some of the reporting, is that there were what we call in Kenya hired goons, which are people who mm. are usually given money by politicians so that they carry out their whims. So they have been used before in various contexts. And a lot of the reporting that I've seen from the local dailies is that because the protesters were making their point in a non-violent way, some of the politicians thought that the best way to counter them is to introduce the element of violence so that, you know, the protests lose credibility. Hmm. But that's just the theory. I haven't seen any tangible proof to it, but I think it's something that has some credence, given our history. So the upshot, though, is that 
President Ruto has pledged not to sign this finance bill that he previously pledged to sign. Like, how significant a victory is that for the protest movement? And how do you like interpret Ruto's reaction and response? I think it was the right response, to be honest. I think it's the kind of thing he should have done even earlier in the week. He should have seen where things were headed. I would say that his first reaction after Tuesday's events, the occupation of parliament, and, you know, Kenya has 47 counties, which are the administrative units, and there were protests in 35 counties. It's not something that we have seen, especially outside of the usual political alignments. Kenya's politics traditionally, unfortunately, has always been around tribal mobilizing. For the first time, we've seen protests that have been tribeless and classless. Kenyans speaking with one voice, and it's the first time we've ever seen it in our history, and they're mostly young people who have gone out on the streets saying, we are jobless, we are poor, and we want a better life for ourselves. That's really interesting. And I I think maybe like worth emphasizing, you know, from afar, I've covered many Kenyan elections. And, and, you know, as you note, electoral politics tends to fall on tribal and ethnic lines. That's like the most important political divisions in the country. But you're saying that what distinguishes this protest movement is the lack of like tribal or ethnic identity being the motivating factor that in fact, those who are protesting are unified mostly by their age over anything else. They're mostly young. Yes. It's a reality that has surprised many people. I think because I guess I have so many young people in my family and I've been hearing what they've been saying over the last, say, years or so. Because, you know, I left university about 15 years ago and there were so many jobs in the economy at that time. We didn't struggle to get jobs. But over the last few years, you have noticed that there are more and more unemployed young people. So it's anger that was slowly boiling up, and it's gotten to a point where all these people can't speak with one voice because they don't have opportunities. And what I think was Ruto's undoing in the way he campaigned was he made a lot of pledges to these young people saying, I'm going to transform your lives, I'm going to make this and this better, I'm going to make sure you know where you are right now is not where you will be after you get in power. But I think he has found the job a lot harder than he expected because, I, like any politician, of course, he would want to deliver on his promises. But he hasn't leveled with the people. And at the same time, as I mentioned, Kenyans are seeing that he is not just fulfilling his promises. The people around him are actively enriching themselves. And a part of what was also alarming Kenyans in the provisions that were contained in the Finance Bill 2023 were discretionary spending Kenyans are wondering why does the presidency need 800 million in discretionary spending? And then you have offices that Kenyans have never heard about, like the office of the first lady, the office of the second lady, and the office of the first cabinet secretary. These are all offices that are getting, you know, money from the taxpayers. Like patronage, basically. It's basic patronage. And then on top of that, they have contained provisions about buying new cars, about, for example, for the deputy president's office, buying trophies. The president's office residence was built for around 400 million Kenyan shillings, but then they were saying they needed to do renovations that were worth 600 million. So you could see that, you know, this is not a government that was caring about how it was spending money. So the conversation, I think, in some ways has gone a lot broader than just the finance bill. And it's about accountability, governance, corruption, and fiscal responsibility which I think the president is becoming more and more aware of because previously he wasn't saying that, but what we heard from him even yesterday was saying, you know, I need to have a conversation with young people about the issues that they care about. And in the next two weeks, he has promised that, you know, he will start such a conversation. But the concern, if I can say, Mark, is, okay, I've seen some of the reporting in the Wall Street Journal or in the New York Times about what is happening. A lot of it is Americanized in the sense that, you know, you see this is the president who visited America, and now this is what is happening in the country. But maybe what you wouldn't see in the foreign press, which in the local context is very clear, is the trust deficit. Explain that more fully, because I I think it's important. That's why I'm interviewing you uh, about this in Nairobi, a Kenyan journalist, as opposed to a, a kind of Westerner. The reality is people think that the president is a slick talker who always says what the people in the room want to hear, but then he doesn't always deliver on what he promises to deliver. So 
even what he's saying right now about dialogue or what he says about ending uh, the corruption and the wastage that we're seeing in government is not being taken very seriously because people have had him make promises before. And he's a, sort of like a victim of his own reputation. So I think it's the thing that will really cause a lot of problems because if you've lost the trust of your people, then what can you do to restore it? I think that's the most important question that is on the minds of a lot of Kenyans right now is, is he capable of keeping his word? Well, I wonder to what extent you think that this kind of really unique moment in, in Kenyan politics is a turning point for something new, or if it is merely just like one kind of iteration in a long line of protests or, you know, how lasting an impact will this moment have, do you think, for the future of Kenyan politics? And how will you measure that? I mean, you said that really what's significant about this protest movement is that it's sort of tribeless. Will that tribeless momentum carry on into the future? And if so, how will you measure that and know that that's happening? The reality is we're in uncharted waters completely. Nobody has witnessed this in Kenya's history. It's caught everybody off guard and we are sort of like making it up as we go. Even the nature of the protests, they're not only tribeless and classless, but they're also leaderless. So that's a very important element. There's nobody marked that you can identify and say that person is the leader of these protests, which is a benefit because Part of the contradictions uh, that Kenyans have called out Ruto, the president, for is that him and his deputy had promised that, you know, there would be no politically instigated arrests or abductions, but yet we have seen a series of them in the last couple of days because they have been trying to get a hold of the people who they think are leading this online movement. But it's just been a series of arrests of popular influencers or activists. So it's also just to... The people who are unhappy with the president, it's been another point of saying, look at you contradicting yourself because you never really say what you mean. So to answer your question about what I'll be watching for in the next, say, few months or a year or so as we build up to the 2027 election is the young people so far have organized online, but politics is, for good or ill, a contact spot. You do need to get out on the ground and campaign if you want political positions. So political parties have to be formed and those political parties have to have leaders and they have to have candidates. So if there's going to be some sort of organization, some sort of party alignment that will happen, that's what I'll be watching for. I think I know the formations that might form. There have been attempts by some TikTokers to say, we all formed a party here and there, but they haven't been very serious. It has to have that element of seriousness, but as long as they can do it and do it in such a way that they persuade a lot of Kenyans that This is a change movement that really means that our politics is going to be reset for good and they're going to be able to sell a vision of the country that is very different from what has been offered so far than the standard chance. Because part of our politics is, in the last few elections, the turnout hasn't been great. And most of the people who haven't turned up, as it happens in many countries, are the young people. In the last election, 8 million Kenyans didn't vote. 5 million Kenyans didn't even bother to register, who are eligible to register. So that's more than half of the people who even voted in the election. So it shows you that there is a pathway that exists for uh, political realignment and a seismic one at that. It's just that these people are not motivated, haven't been motivated enough so far, but we are seeing a movement for the first time in our history that offers that possibility. And I personally am very excited about it. That's really interesting. So, I mean, like, I do know that the previous election was two very old people. There was very little enthusiasm around their election. Like you said, I sort of do wonder if like a leader emerges who's a little more dynamic, who can harness that energy, then it really could be something really new and unique in, in a very important and very significant country in the region. That, that'd be really interesting to see. Yes, absolutely. But that's just one element of it. The other element, which I think we've already gotten a test of, is strangely enough, as fate would have it, the ruling party, the UDA party, was actually having party primaries in the last couple of weeks. So what happened is that they were actually supposed to have party primaries this week on the 25th. 
But because of everything that's happening, all those party primaries have been postponed and no new date has been announced. And the talk right now is that the party is in a lot of confusion because they thought they were so popular that in their planning, the calculation was that, you know, we have a very popular president who's automatically going to get a second term and this is going to be the most popular party in the country. Therefore, all the candidates will want to come in. So let's have party primaries early before the election come and we will be much more organized than any other political party. But all those plans have been thrown out the window. So hmm. everything is up for grabs. Ruto isn't as untouchable as he was before. There's a lot of talk, and I've written about it, that he might just be the first term president that we've ever witnessed in this country. Yeah, every president has been reelected. There has been no one-term president. That's There's interesting. No one-term president. So the benefit of incumbency in a country where you basically have the resources of the state for your use have meant that you know it's been very difficult to dislodge the incumbent. But then now, we have never had the situation where the incumbent has had so many, you know, Kenyans basically turn against the government. And we've never had a situation in which a finance bill has been rejected. So we're living in a, in a time of many firsts, and the popular imagination now has the notion that this president actually might not see, you know, a second term. And a lot of the protests actually even from today, Thursday, was on the streets, people in Kenya, people protesting abroad in places like London saying, Ruto must go. And it's the kind of chant that people used to say about our former dictator, who was uh, Daniel Moy, a political mentor of the current president. People used to chant, I remember in my childhood, Moy must go, Moy must go. But now it's being applied to him. And I think hmm. it's the kind of thing that doesn't lead to a nice place. So I'd, I'd be very worried if I was him. So I do have one question filtered through an American lens, which is, you know, like the timing of these protests was really hard to ignore in terms of how it was juxtaposed with the deployment of Kenyan police officers to Haiti, which followed a meeting in Washington between Ruto and Biden in which Kenya and the United States established very close ties. Kenya became a major non-NATO ally. Is this factoring in any of the protests whatsoever? I mean, based on what you've described, it seems like they're truly wholly separate things, but it's just like the, the timing of both the deployment of these Kenyan police officers to Haiti and the protests just seem like very interesting to note, if nothing else. I personally don't give much credence to some of the people who are theorizing that maybe Ruto is some kind of puppet of the West. It's part of what some protesters and some people on social media keep saying about, you know, what they don't like about the president. But I don't think it's a big factor in terms of what has made Kenyans uh, really angry. It doesn't help him because, you know, part of what people call out as a contradiction in the president's posture is when he became president in 2022, he really struck out as a Pan-Africanist. That, you know, Africa has long been under this shadow of people not seeing its true promise. And I think it's time that Kenya and Africans, you know, show that we are actually, you know, a great continent, which we are. And he said, I'm the president who's going to champion this vision of Africa. And he's done it on many platforms, speaking on the continent and outside. But he does that, but then also he goes to America and he sits behind Biden's desk and Biden has his arm on his shoulder. And to some Pan-Africanists, it's a very jarring image because they perceive any African president who has that kind of American support as a puppet. Personally, I think Ruto, his real instinct is for money and power. It's never to serve anybody's interests. So if it was the Chinese who are offering him a lot of money, then he would you know, do the Chinese bidding. And if it was the Americans who are offering him a lot of money, then he would do the Americans bid. He's just, you know, he's a day trader. <laughs> I hate to say it, but it's true. <laughs> if you really follow the man's history, then you realize he's a very transactional politician. Let me put it that way. Maybe that's more All diplomatic. Right. <laughs> and I guess uh, many politicians are. He's not a very principled politician. So I don't give much credence to the notion that, you know, he's somehow serving the whims of the American president. But... He is a president who is in a hurry to be a successful president. He really wants to be a consequential president. There is a schism that 
uh, developed between him and his uh, boss, the former president, Uhuru Kenyatta. And because of that, and I agree with this analysis, he really wants to outdo the former president and seem more like a success. And for that reason, he really wants to get as much money as possible pumped into the economy, whether it's coming from the Americans or the Chinese, to serve his mission. So it's for that reason that, you know, he's agreed, I guess, to send our soldiers to Haiti. It's not that, you know, he's a great friend, president of the Americans and he, he cares about the Haitians, but he really just is looking for money. And a few of the politicians who are in his party have said that party out loud when there were some court cases here that were fighting the Haitian uh, deployment. They were saying, you guys don't want us to get money. Why don't you want us to get dollars when you need dollars? So that says, you know, everything that you need to know. But on top of that, I think the main consequence, though, outside of the American dimension or the Haitian dimension, Kenyans, I think, would be equally angry if the soldiers were being sent to Uganda or Tanzania or any other African country because the country has so many security problems all around that we can't really afford to have our soldiers around in the places that we need them or our police officers around in the places that we need them. So Kenyans are just asking themselves, why do you care about the challenges that other countries face and not the ones that we face? So that, that I think is the primary issue and not that he's aligned with the Americans. I don't think many reasonable Kenyans care about that. Well, Brian, thank you so much for your time. This was really helpful. My pleasure, Mark. Thanks for listening to Global Dispatches. The show is produced by me, Mark Leon Goldberg. It is edited and mixed by Levi Sharp. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts, make sure to follow the show and enable automatic downloads to get new episodes as soon as they're released. On Spotify, tap the bell icon to get a notification when we publish new episodes. And of course, please visit globaldispatches.org to get on our free mailing list, get in touch with me, and access our full archive. Thank you.